Well, good morning. Let me extend my welcome to you uh, here at Central and to those of you joining us online today. And also, I want to say good morning, CLM North, because today we're trialing a video message at CLM North. So I wonder if here at Central, uh, could we make a little bit of noise and show some love to CLM North? <laughs> we're with you. We're good to see you. And we're so grateful for the grace of God in this season, aren't we? The season of maturity and multiplication as he grows us into a church beyond just one site. And if you're here and you're visiting us today, well, also a particularly warm welcome to you. If you normally worship somewhere else, you're just here because it's the summer, then please do take our greetings back to your leader or minister. Well, this week, we're in week five of our series in one and two kings, Elisha, positioned for power, looking at the life of Elisha the prophet and those around him, learning from them how we might also be positioned for power. As we focus this morning on this great, glorious, powerful God, you know, we serve a living and a powerful God. Yes, we, the God we serve is the maker and the sustainer of the cosmos, who's neither changed nor withdrawn. He is the same God as at Central we've sung here this morning. He has neither changed nor withdrawn from his creation. He remains transcendent and imminent, present in what he has made. You see, in the Old Testament, we see the power of God at work in prophets like Elisha because he put his spirit onto particular people at particular times for particular purposes. The generally prophets, priests, kings who were empowered to have the agency of God on the earth. But we live in a New Testament era post-Pentecost where God has poured out his Holy Spirit and his power on all who believe, which means that for us as Christians here today, CLM Central, CLM North, and wherever you are joining us online, we have the power of God available to, to us, all of us, all the time, everywhere, through his indwelling Holy Spirit. Amen. We maybe don't feel like it all the time, but we are positioned for power. And that's why these scriptures in Kings can provoke and encourage us. If you've missed any of the previous weeks, they're all available to catch up on YouTube or SoundCloud. You can find them via the CLM website if you click on resources and sermons. We began a few weeks ago looking at the call of Elisha, where this call and mantle is put on him by the prophet Elijah. Then we looked at the double portion of Elijah's spirit that was both requested and received by Elisha. And then the last two weeks, we've been in 2 Kings 4, hearing first about the widow who had just a little oil. And we saw how the power of God moved using just the little that she had. And then last week, Jonathan took us to the Shunammite woman, the same chapter, with the exhortation that I know really struck a chord with many of us for us to make room in our lives. And today we come to 2 Kings 5. Why not turn there if you've got a Bible or a device? There's a title in my Bible for this chapter of Scripture, and it says, Naaman healed of leprosy, which is a bit of a spoiler ahead of reading the story. But you know, there's so much going on in this chapter. There is more to discover than just the physical outcome of Naaman. There's so much in this text. Actually, there's some treasures that we are literally going to walk past and not even point to this morning. In a story that was so pertinent, even Jesus made reference to it. You can read that in Luke 4, in the synagogue at Nazareth. In fact, it so provoked his Jewish listeners there that they took him out onto a high place to try to kill him. I'm hoping for a more friendly reception this morning. I hope I can trust you for that. And if you're the kind of person who takes notes and you want a title, well, my title this morning is No God But the Lord, A Tale of Two Servants. In a moment, we'll read the story from the biblical text, but a little bit of background that can sometimes be helpful for us to understand some of the dynamics when we come to the story. The season that this takes place in is one of the most desperate for Israel. I think we'll see a map come up on the screen. You see, the kingdom was already divided into Israel, purple in the top, more north, whose king ruled from Samaria, and Judah in green, whose king ruled from Jerusalem. And the geopolitical landscape landscape was changing for both components of God's people, largely as a result of their unfaithfulness to God's covenant. 
The tribes of Israel were, becoming, were coming under increasing pressure from their northern neighbors, from Aram and still further north, Assyria. They had brutal, aggressive military machines who were pressurizing, beginning to raid the land of the tribes of Israel, carrying off hostages and who knows what else. I'm of course not unaware of the ongoing and escalating conflict even today. Escalations even overnight, which remains a point for prayer. I'm not seeking to make comment through this scripture into that extremely complex current spiritual, political, and military situation. But it's good for us to see where things were at as we come to the story. So let's read 2 Kings 5. We're gonna read verses one to 19. Now Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now, bands of uh, raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, said the king of Aram. I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes. Oh my God, can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king had torn his robes, he sent this message, why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me. He will know there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went to, with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you'll be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? And so we turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you wash and be cleansed? So he went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. And Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimmon to bow down and he is leaning on my arm and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha says. Wow. Lots going on in this account. Naaman gets healed from his leprosy, but also has a revelation that there is no God but the Lord, no God but Yahweh, the God of Israel. And yes, there is another part to the story. There is a second servant we're yet to hear about, but we'll go there in just a moment. First, we're gonna look at Naaman and the first servant in the middle of this slightly unusual household situation and see what we can learn from there that was required for them to be positioned for power. What brought them to have their involvement in an extraordinary healing and revelation of the God of Israel. 
We get introduced to this commander, Naaman, something, I guess, of a national celebrity among his people, popular with the royals, a successful and celebrated military leader. Things would have been going great for Naaman, except that he had leprosy. He was suffering from a skin condition for which no one seemed to have a cure. Now, it will, I'm sure, seem abhorrent to us that in a raid of Israel, a young girl had been taken captive and was now serving in Naaman's household as a servant to Mrs. Naaman, Naaman's wife. This is servant number one in a tale of two servants. We can only imagine the trauma, the sadness that this young girl must have endured, which perhaps makes her actions and her attitudes even more remarkable. We might anticipate that she would be fearful. She might be bitter towards her mistress because of what she'd been through, and that would not be unreasonable. But she speaks out to her mistress with faith in the God of Israel and with caring concern for her mistress's husband. She says, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. You know, it is this statement of faith in the goodness and the greatness of God that triggers everything that unfolds subsequently, because she had faith to speak out about the power of God, the release of God's power that happened, uh, that followed, the eventual healing and changing of name, and it was all set in motion here by the words of a servant girl whose name we don't even know get told. She was positioned for power because she had faith to speak out. Faith to speak out. In fact, this is the first thing I think we can learn from this passage today about what being positioned for power requires. It requires faith to speak out. You see, when we testify and we speak about the goodness and the greatness of God, it begins to shift things. Whether you see it or not, it begins to make room. This young servant had faith to speak out, to speak about God's power to heal through the prophet. Even when many in her nation overlooked God, overlooked the prophet, overlooked the power. And in fact, if we were to listen to Jesus' words, we understand that there were no lepers in Israel who were healed, although there were lepers. But this girl, she had faith. And she had faith to speak out, and it positioned her to play a part. And it positioned her master to be able to respond and to entreat the prophet for himself. She had faith to speak out. I think what this girl is displaying here is a working understanding of what the people of God were called to be. They were made to be a people made for mission and position for power with access to God and his power through covenant for the blessing of all the nations. And whilst much of Israel had forgotten that covenant and lost their way in this, this young, exiled servant girl somehow knew who she was. She understood that as one of God's chosen people, she had been positioned for power to reveal the goodness and the greatness of the Lord, the God of Israel, to those beyond its geographical and ethnic boundaries. Perhaps as we hear this today, we might consider afresh the places that we find ourselves I'm sure many of us find ourselves sometimes in places that we want to be, sometimes in some situations and circumstances that really were not our choice. We don't desire to be there. But might we view ourselves in those places as the covenant people of God who have been positioned for power to reveal the goodness and greatness of God there beyond the boundaries of where he's already seen and known? And what is required of us in those places is simply to have faith that speaks out, that's willing to testify to something of the goodness and the greatness of God. We don't have to know everything, but just to say something. It could sound like saying, could I pray for you for that? It's an expression of faith that God can do something. It could be, I'm a Christian, I believe God wants to help you in this. It could be, you should come to church sometime, it would do you good. You should come to encounter because the love of God will impact you. Or whatever words you might say that would be an expression of your faith 
that speaks out to testify to the true and the living God. Because friends, when we begin to speak like this, simple words that we speak out, it begins to change other people's perception and their expectation of God. It positions them for power. Whether we see it or not in the moment, it begins to change them. They go home at night, they put their head on the pillow, what words might come back to them? The words you spoke earlier that day. It positions them for power, for an encounter with God that might be healing or peace or salvation or some other point where God steps into their life and they begin to see who he is when they couldn't see it before. Sometimes our words work quickly in people's lives, sometimes slowly, but our job is to speak the words. Just a few weeks ago, I met uh, a gentleman called Hajj at the click and collect point for my grocery shopping. The second time I met him, his words to me, his first words were to me, I'm sorry I didn't make it to your church. Now let me be really clear, I didn't invite him to come to church. You might be shocked to hear that. We'd just, we'd had a brief conversation about church. He'd asked me what I did. He'd asked me where it was. And I said, oh, it's in the city center. He said, oh, not many people go to the city center anymore, do they? So I simply said, well, quite a lot of people come on a Sunday morning. 1,200 people come to the city center every morning to worship Jesus at this church. And to that, he said, oh, maybe I should come sometime. I said, yeah, that would be great if you came sometime. And if you come, come and say hello to me. If you're here today, Hajj, and I haven't seen you, please come and say hello. But the truth is this, our words change people's perceptions and expectations when we have faith to speak out. You don't have to have a deep theological message. Just do something to point to God with some element of faith. And it's amazing what he can do with it. And if you're here and you're not sure if you have faith, well, friends, faith comes by hearing the word, by reminding ourselves what God has done through generation after generation after generation. It it stirs us. The words in the Bible, they are living words that change our hearts and grow our faith. So if you know you need to grow in faith, well, get in the word. This servant girl shows us that being positioned for power requires faith that speaks out because you never know what could follow. Let's take a look at Naaman. What followed for Naaman was extraordinary. This military hero, he listens to his wife's servant girl. It would be really, really understandable, wouldn't it, if he said, I'm not listening to your servant. What can a prophet in Israel do? We would understand if that was his response, this famous guy, but no. Naaman even goes to the king, tells the king what the servant girl has said. What a turn of events. Naaman heard and he responded. He got permission from the king. He got diplomatic letters to take with him so he could travel across the border to try and find the cure that he needed. Naaman heard what was said. He took it seriously. He made an active response. And you see, the second thing I think we can learn from this text here this morning about what is required to be positioned for power is an active response. He did something with what he had heard. He spoke about it. He went to the king. He set off. You know, I think if he'd stayed at home, I don't think anything would have happened. I don't think he would have got healed. He was positioned for power because he responded to what he heard with an active response. Let me hear you say active response. He did something, he moved, he went to seek what he was looking for because being positioned for power requires an active response. Jesus said something really similar in unpacking for us the principles of the kingdom, Matthew 7, 7. He said these words, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. If you're hoping to receive something, you probably need to make an active response to the Lord. Ask, seek, knock. These are principles of the kingdom. This is what Naaman did. Now, of course, it wasn't all straightforward for Naaman when he arrived in Samaria and he went to the king. We have this little misunderstanding. The king, you see, was a ruler of an Israel which had broken its affinity with both the law and the prophets and mistook the honest request of Naaman for a trick by the king of Aram. He thought he'd sent him and that 
because the king of Israel underestimated the power both of God and Elisha, he thought he was going to have to send him back uncured. And that when he did that, the king of Aram would take that as a provocation, like you've refused to do this, and would then invade the land. The king, you see, had less clue about the call and purpose of the nation that he was leading than the servant girl in exile. It doesn't occur to the king that Elisha can do anything. He really doesn't rate Elisha or Elisha's God. He doesn't redirect Naaman to the right address. In fact, it's only when Naaman hears that the king has torn his clothes that he sends a message to send Elisha to me. He will know there is a prophet in Israel. Unspoken, even if you don't. And so Naaman, with his horses, his chariots, his money, his wealth, and all of that parks up outside Elisha's house. He's made this active response, position for power, ready for a moment of encounter and healing to get what he is looking for. He had to move, he had to go, he had to be willing to be redirected. It was an active response. If we want to be positioned for power, in fact, even if we want to grow as Christians, friends, we need to have an active response to what we hear. Again, the words of Jesus, again in Matthew 7, he said, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, does something with what he hears. And I wonder this morning for all of us, has God said something to us that we haven't yet actioned or responded to? Has he asked us to speak to someone or to do something for someone, maybe to give them something? Is there a step of faith he's been prompting you to take? Maybe to commit to a life group or sign up for Rooted, to come to a prayer meeting, to say yes to something you've been invited to step into. Because friends, being positioned for power requires an active response. Everything's all set for Naaman's moment. Things don't play out for him immediately quite as he had expected. Elisha sends a messenger out to him, tells him to go and wash in the Jordan seven times. And his response is not good. This is not what I came for. We get this moment now. We see Naaman. He's angry. He's proud. He had in mind how this was going to go, and it wasn't like this. I'm sure, haven't we all had those ideas? We show up somewhere, we think, I know how this is going to go. I've got this version in my head, and it's positive, and it's good. And then we show up, and actually, things don't play out quite how we thought they would. The Airbnb is not how it looked in the photos. You hear me? The hotel is not how it looked on the website. It's testing when that happens. And we can see Naaman was clearly tested. He thought this was going to be special. He thought it was going to be supernatural. It was going to be awesome. And it was at least going to be in person. I surely thought he'd come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. But for him, this was turning out to be humiliating, disappointing, ordinary. And he dug his heels in and turned and went off in a rage. Sometimes we can all get a bit cross when God doesn't do things how we wanted. Thankfully, his servant spoke up to him and he listened. He said, if he told you to do something great, something awesome, wouldn't you have done it? Something difficult. So why not do the simple thing? This is a challenge to Naaman. A challenge to his pride, a laying down of his expectations. Is he willing to respond with ordinary obedience? You see, he was a successful man. He was at the top of his game. He was well-known, well-rewarded. He expected certain treatment, certain honor, certain respect. And in this moment, he's being invited to receive something from the God of Israel, but it required ordinary obedience. See, I think being positioned for power requires ordinary obedience. Dealing with the pride that says, I'm beyond this, I'm too big for this, too good for this, too high up for this. Laying aside the pride that says, I deserve the best, or the pride that despises the simple things, the ordinary things, the unseen things, the lowly things, the pride that has at least traces in all of our hearts. 
Naaman had to humble himself. He had to embrace the ordinary. To do what was ordinary, to do what he was told. Even though he didn't think it was a great plan, he thought there were better rivers, cleaner rivers, with less E. coli in them. Ordinary obedience was what he was called to. And there was a wrestle for sure, as there can so often be. But he did it. He went down. He dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. His flesh was restored and he became clean. He was cleansed. He was healed. His ordinary obedience, doing this simple thing he was told to do, positioned him for power. And he received the thing he'd come for. But in this moment, something way more profound occurs at the same time, more profound even than his physical healing. And we get sight of it as he returns to Elisha and says, now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. No God but the Lord. There's no God but the Lord. You know, it's true. Sometimes people experience miraculous healing and it doesn't change what they think about God. The revelation of Jesus is not the same as receiving a healing by power, but two things happen to Naaman. He's healed and he has a revelation, that there is only one true God and it is the God of Israel. And his response is from now on, I'm only ever going to worship the Lord. I'm not going to worship anyone else. He vows he's never going to do it. And he seeks Pardon for the unpreventable that may happen when he returns home and as part of his job has to go into the temple of Rimmon. It's like if I'm next to the king and the king bows, I may inadvertently bow. I can kind of imagine him arm in arm, king bows, I'm going to struggle to stay upright. Can I be pardoned for this? You see, he knows that he cannot entertain idolatry. Now he's seen and understood that there is only one true living God, the God of power, the God of heaven and earth. You don't be caught bowing to someone else once you've realized there is no God but the Lord. And Naaman says to Elisha, please accept a gift. You see, Naaman's previous experience would have been of pagan gods where there would have been offers of rituals for healing in exchange for payment of some kind. It would never have entered Naaman's head that he would come and get something for free. That's why he came with a chariot, with money, with gold and silver and 10 sets of clothes he was expecting to pay. But Elisha's response to him is, I won't accept a thing. And he gets pushed. He's like, no, 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 even when urged, I will not Accept. You see, I think Elisha understood no transaction was being done here with the Lord Almighty for Naaman to obtain what he desired with payment from his wealth. But in his grace, the God of Israel was revealing himself and his splendor to a man from beyond the boundaries of Israel and inviting him into a changed and cleansed life as a worshiper of Yahweh. pointing to the gospel that would reach out to all nations, the God of Israel, inviting a man from beyond the boundaries into a changed and a cleansed life as a worshiper of Yahweh. This was a gift of grace. Because Naaman humbled himself in ordinary obedience. The interaction was complete. There was no transaction to be made. This is ordinary obedience, what it opens up for us. You know, most of us want to see the power of God at work, to see his gospel changing and transforming lives, our lives and other people's. But many of us wrestle, don't we, with ordinary obedience, the hidden stuff, the small stuff, the ordinary things, praying, asking, repenting, believing, encouraging, forgiving, stacking the chairs, doing the seemingly insignificant things that we think maybe God has told us to do, but friends, ordinary obedience positions us for power. In a season before we moved to Coventry, there was a time, I don't remember how many months it was, but I'd I'd come to a conviction that God had called me and positioned me to function in leadership of church alongside Martin. Martin was working for a church, I was not. But there was no apparent avenue to explore or engage with this concept. So in that season, I was simply serving in a couple of different places. I was a part of a team 
that I went out and did healing on the streets. I was involved in some mentoring of young women who were recovering from drug addiction. And I served in the church on a Sunday in the group for two-year-olds during the sermon. At Little Stars, it was called. You might call it a season of ordinary obedience. And in Little Stars with the two-year-olds, we'd mainly play and then sit down to read a Bible story if you could. It's kind of a lot of crowd control with two-year-olds. Then I would speak a blessing over each one by name. And if they'd let me, I'd put a hand on their head as I spoke a blessing. You see, I just decided that I was going to try and sow the maximum blessing into each of those little lives that I could in the time that I was there. Ordinary obedience. And the interesting thing to me is this. I've observed and others have commented to me that of all the things that I now do in senior leadership, there is a particular grace and anointing when I speak a blessing. And I'm sure it is linked to the ordinary obedience of a different season in a room where no one was looking, with 10 two-year-olds, some crawling off a mat, some sitting still, when I sought to speak blessing over them. Ordinary obedience, friends, positions us for power. Faith that speaks out, an active response, ordinary obedience. We see this in Naaman and his wife's servant girl. But as I said, this is a tale of two servants. So let's return to the text. The second servant, we're going to pick up the second half of verse 19 and read through to verse 27. Naaman, of course, has been told to go in peace by Elisha. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting him from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running towards him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? He asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away and they left. When he went in and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? Uh, Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or take clothes or, or olive groves or vineyards or flocks or herds or male or female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous and it had become as white as snow. The story takes something of an unpredictable and uncomfortable turn here. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, uh, presumably was the one lined up for succession of Elisha. Just as Elisha had served Elijah and then become the prophet, Gehazi is here positioned for power. His role had positioned him for succession to be the one officially positioned for power, but he actually models for us what not to do. I don't know exactly what it is that motivates Gehazi to pursue Naaman and make up a story. Perhaps it was his own greed. He had seen all the wealth that Naaman had come ready to pay and perhaps wanted some of it for himself. Not unreasonable. I think also that There sounds to me like there's an ethnic undertone in what Gehazi is doing and saying here. It's like, my master was too easy on name and that Aramean. As you might expect, if another country is beginning to invade your country, you may not feel so charitable towards them. He should have made him pay. So he pursues Naaman, and he lies to him. He tells the story. He gets the gear. So much stuff. Two servants carry it back for him until he takes it off them and hides it in his house, thinking he's going to get away with it. Gehazi underestimates the power of God vested in Elisha. For Elisha knows, he can see. Be sure your sins will find you out. It plays out a little bit like a conversation between a parent and a child, doesn't it? Where have you been? (laughs) 
And the consequence for Gehazi is severe. He himself is afflicted with leprosy. It's perhaps the moment that his hopes of succeeding Elisha are brought to a brutal conclusion. He will not be positioned for power. You see, friends, being positioned for power requires no exclusive rights. That is, we can't acquire something for ourselves whilst preventing others from doing the same. Being positioned for power requires no exclusive rights. You see, friends, there is no God but the Lord. Yahweh alone. He is compassionate and gracious. He is merciful. He gives without requiring recompense. I hope this is the God that you have experienced. His desire is the blessing of all nations through the people he chooses and calls to be his so that all might see and all might be saved, as Paul later writes to Timothy. Because to be positioned for power is to be positioned to minister to be positioned to serve, to be positioned to carry the goodness, the greatness of God, his love and his mercy, to help others to see that there is no God but the Lord, the God of Israel. There is no God but the God of power and of grace who sent his son so that all people might respond to the invitation into a changed and cleansed life as a worshiper of Yahweh. I read this morning in Acts chapter 3, all the prophets foretold of this day, Peter says, as he speaks, as he's just healed a beggar, a cripple. All the prophets foretold that there would be salvation for all and an outpouring of power. The picture of Elisha, Gehazi, it's speaking of what is to come. You see, friends, we cannot hold out to others an offer from God less generous than the one he has held out to us. As Jesus would say to his followers eight or nine centuries later, Matthew 10, freely you've received, freely give, freely give. And if like Gehazi, we allow God's gift to be received or tasted by others, but not freely, as we have received them, we distort to them the nature and the image of the one true living God. Being positioned for power requires no exclusive rights. All is by grace. Grace for those I consider to be my people and grace for those I consider to be beyond my people. No exclusive rights. Sarah, I wonder if you could come. Paul writes this in Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then to the Gentile. Friends, we are positioned for power. Power has been poured out. Jesus said, Acts 1.8, you will receive power. Friends, it's happened. Pentecost happened. If we've received the Holy Spirit, we have received power to be carriers of the gospel, the power of God that brings salvation to all who believe, power to carry the very presence of God. What a holy thing. Power to introduce others to the true and the living God. Power to invite them through Jesus into a cleansed and changed life as a worshiper of Yahweh. They can be in. What a privilege it is. We're positioned for power, but it needs stewarding well. We can think we're positioned like Gazhazi. And of course, we need to attend to the choices that we make and the heart attitudes that we harbor. Being positioned for faith, it requires, sorry, being positioned for power requires faith that speaks out, an active response. It requires ordinary obedience and no exclusive rights. How can we respond to this message today? I'm going to invite us in a moment into an active response. The message, of course, demands nothing less. At, at CLM North, Luke is going to lead you in your response from now. So we just pray uh, that you will know the Lord moving powerfully with you as he leads you to respond right now. Here in the room at Central, do you have it in your heart 
to be positioned for power, to be someone who could show others, help them to see that there is a God who is the true and the living God, who is good and gracious and loves them and gave himself for them, and that there is an invitation for them to be part of those who are changed and cleansed and are worshippers of Yahweh. I wonder if I can invite us to stand to our feet. In a moment, I'm going to invite us to, if we want to respond, to come out of our seats. And there's two different kind of avenues here. The first is this, that you want to respond say, actually, I just want to line myself up with God to be positioned for power. And there may be a particular aspect of this where this hits. You think, I need to speak or I need to be active in my response. I know the Lord's speaking to me about my pride and as an ordinary obedience, He's calling out of me. And I'm just going to respond today to say, Lord, I'm lining up with you. I know you speak over me that I'm positioned for power and I'm moving today to receive something fresh. I'm going to pray for the Lord to pour out his power afresh on us as a people. The second is this. Perhaps you've been journeying for a while. Maybe you're asking God for something. You've been believing God for something. You don't have to tell anyone this morning. But I encourage you to step out of your seat and come to the front as an active response. Say, Lord, I'm trusting you. I'm asking you. I need you to move. The presence of God, the power of God is present to heal this morning, I believe. There's faith in the room. We're gonna sing a final song that is not a response of what I am gonna do. It is a response of honoring the name of the Lord, of lifting him up because there is no God but the Lord. There's something happens in the revelation of who God is that brings shift, that brings change. I'm gonna begin to pray. And if you know you need to respond this morning, then why not begin to head out of your seat and come to the front. Father, we wanna say thank you this morning that we are a people that you have positioned for power. We thank you for covenant. We thank you for what you entrust to your people. We thank you that you have poured out your spirit, your power on all people. And you have invited us to be part of your redemptive purpose in the world to show yourself and to draw men and women to be changed and cleansed by you. And so we say thank you this morning, Lord. And we come as we are aware of how we don't always feel position for power and aware of the wrestle in us. And we pray, Lord, would you put a boldness in us today? Lord, would you pour out your power and your anointing upon us afresh today that we would be those who have faith to speak out. We would be those who don't hold back but have an active response, who get beyond our pride to ordinary obedience. Lord, would we see your power at work in us and through us. And Lord, we thank you that your name is above every name, that you are the God of power. You are the God who heals. You are the God who redeems. And you are the God who restores. You're the God of the breakthrough. And so we simply pray today, Father, for every person who comes like Naaman, say, I need the true and the living God. I need healing. I'm making my response today. And we ask, Lord, in this simple space at the front of this room, would you pour out your power afresh, not at the waving of a man's hand or the placing of a man's hand, but just would you pour out your power to heal and to bring breakthrough, to bring release, to bring healing, to remove power, to remove pain. And Jesus, As we do this, would your glory be revealed? The greatness of the true and the living God, the only God, the God of Israel, be honored and glorified and adored. We exalt you, Jesus. And we position ourselves to receive from you.